Hey everybody, thank you for joining us today. We pray that this message reaches you wherever you are at today in whatever situation you are facing. We pray that the Lord ministers to your life. Hang on till the end, and I want to say a couple more things to you before we're done. Amen. Would you stand to your feet as we honor the reading of God's Word? You got your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to jump right into this, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're in a series called Building God's Way, but I want to um, talk today, because of everything that's happening around the nation, I want to talk to you today about foundations in a building, but foundations of revival. Foundations of revival. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Did you come hungry this morning? I'll be honest, when I was standing up here a minute ago looking out over the audience, it was like I could just see hungry people. And I just thought, Lord, this is the, the buffet that we've got. This is it. This is what we've got to present. This is the buffet. And today, as you've, if I can use an old Mississippi term, if you, well, this just sounds bad, bellied up to the bar. It probably sounds bad. But uh, as you come to the table, as you come to the table, I believe this word is going to awaken some things in you. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For there are envy, strife, and divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let, let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he is built on and it endures, he will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We open our hearts, we open our ears, we open our minds to receive what the Spirit is saying to us right now. And we just say, amen, so be it in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, we ask all these things. And all God's people together said, amen. amen. Turn around, high five somebody and say revival and you may be seated. The church at Corinth was like every other church in the world. I got a news flash for you today. There is no church that is perfect. No church that is perfect. No offense, but the moment we walked in, it quit being perfect. Because we're not perfect. And so Corinth was like every other church, it wasn't perfect. And, and you think this is the first century of Christianity. You think everybody's excited, everybody's on the same page. I mean, surely they're going to get it right from the start. But like everything else, they had envy, they had strife, they had these things rising up. And they began to argue over who their favorite preacher was. Who do you have on YouTube? Who do you have on Spotify? Who do you listen to? Which podcast do you listen to? Because I like Paul. I mean, that dude can write some words. I mean, that dude spits out some letters that are amazing. I love me some Apostle Paul. That's some good stuff. And then somebody else said, you know what? I don't really like Paul. That dude preaches too long. <laughs> like one time I heard he preached so long that somebody fell asleep in a window and fell out and died. And he had to go pray for him to come back to life. That dude just preaches way too long. Give me Apollos. That's my guy. I mean, Apollos, he preaches it in a way I understand. You and Paul, y'all confuse me. Apollos... We on the same page. I got it, I got it going on with Apollos. 
And they begin to argue, who's better, Paul or Apollos? And it was about them trying to figure out. And Paul writes a letter to them and he said, do you not understand? Number one, we're all on the same team. It's not one versus the other. We're all in this thing together. And he said, here's what is happening. I am doing one thing and Apollos is doing something else, but they're meant to complement each other. One of us is sowing seed. One is watering. One is doing this. One is doing that. But his point is this, but it is God who is giving the increase. It is God who is doing it. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of this letter, he shifts gears and he goes from agriculture to construction. And he says, matter of fact, not only are we sowing seeds, but we are building something. And he said, we're laying a foundation. And Apollos is laying a foundation. I'm laying a foundation. One person is building. But here's the key. Number one, it is God who is the master builder. It is God who puts all this together and he builds what he is building. And the foundation, even though we're laying the foundation, the foundation is one thing and the foundation is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the one that we're laying all of this on. But what I love, he says, is this. The point is this, that Christ is the master builder. Listen to me. I believe God is building lives. He's building people. But I also believe something. He is building something as we come together and is called his church. And whenever the world tries to do everything that it's doing, right now God is breathing in America. It is sweeping revival across our land. Because you know what God wanted to remind the culture of? I will build my church and the gate gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm building my church and there's nothing that's going to stop what I'm doing. That's my bride and you try to come against my bride and I got something to say about that and so I'm just going to, I'm going to breathe a little bit right now on the world and I'm going to let the spirit of God fall and I'm going to let revival take off because I want you to know devil, I'm still building my church and there's nothing you can do to stop it. Amen. God is building his church he's the one building he's the one doing all this and the, the breath of revival that we see taking place what we see God doing let me say something, a couple things about revival to you I think it's important to understand this I don't know exactly you know, how all this plays out um, in, 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 in America but God is breathing this but here, here's the problem if we're not careful we try to and I'll say this in a, in a, in a few moments as well but we try to put our understanding on what God is doing. And, and, and here's the thing. Revivals, and this may, con, let me, I don't want to confuse you, but revivals, as far as meeting and gathering spaces, was never meant to last forever. Let me give you the best example. Peter, because today is what we call in, in the Christian calendar, Transfiguration Sunday. It's the, the day we celebrate Jesus going to the mountain and he's transfigured. They're on top of the mountain and the glory of God sets down. And Peter is so excited he said, let's build three tents and live here. I want to live in this. I want to live right here. I love this. This is good stuff. I want to live right here. And you know what? God says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. In other words, shut up, Peter, and listen to what we're trying to tell you. And you know what the Bible says? They walk off the mountain and come down, and they see a boy that is demon-possessed that needs to be healed and set free. Because here's the thing. God sends revival. Now listen, once again, I'm talking about two different things. I believe there's a spirit of revival that has been at Landmark Church for some time now where we are seeing lives changed, we are seeing miracles occur, we are seeing things happen. That is meant to be all the time. I don't mean that. But I'm saying specific gatherings, what you see happening at Asbury, what you see happening at other Lee University and other colleges, what God is doing right now is breathing life. But it's for this reason, so that people take the fire of God and they don't stay there and live there. They take it out to the street and they start fires everywhere that they go. These are meant to be moments. And if we're not careful, listen, if I live closer to Asbury, I would be there tomorrow because I want to experience those kind of things. I have no problem with that. But it's crazy for me to go take my family and say, we're going to move there and live right there. When God says, I want you to take what you experience and go take it back to where you're at and you go see lives change in your community, in your area. Listen, I love what God is doing. I'm not knocking it. I love it and I want to experience it and that's all great. But listen to me. 
What I'm telling you is this. If we're not careful, we begin to say, God, you've got to do it this way. And we begin to manufacture what we think is supposed to happen instead of saying, God, change me so that I can go back and see my community change, so my family's changed, so on the job tomorrow somebody experiences the goodness of God because of the fire of God that I am carrying with me. And we are meant to allow God to move in our hearts so that other people can be changed. Amen? Amen. So here are the foundations, I believe, of revival. I've said some of these um, recently, but I just feel like the Lord will not let me stop. And so three things. Number one, I've said this a lot, so I'm not going to say much, but number one is expectancy. Expectancy. Now listen, here's the thing about expectancy. Once again, many times we get God in a box. God, you've got to do it this way. This is the way you did it at Azusa. This is the way you did it at Brownsville. This is the way you've done it other places. You've got to do it this way. And here's the thing. Elijah goes on the mountain, and he thinks God's going to be in the whirlwind. He thinks God's going to be in the earthquake. And he, there's God. God just showed up. Nope. There's God. Nope. But in a still, small voice, God speaks to him. And if Elijah had thought it was everything else and walked off the mountain, he would have never heard God speak. And listen to me, what God is going to do right now, stop putting your expectations on there, but come with a sense of expectancy. God, I know you're going to do something, but I don't know what it's going to look like, and I'm open to however you want to move. I'm going to come expecting you to do something, but I'm not going to come with this preconceived notion that I know what it's going to look like. But I believe this, as we come home, Hungry, as we come expecting, as we pray for God to show up and look for ways of what he's doing. Look for things and listen for things. In our first service, I'm kind of embarrassed somebody at the end. I felt bad. But um, in our first service, uh, we had uh, somebody came to me at the very end. And while we were up here, the spirit of God's moving. I just got on my knees and I just, I just did that. I was just praying for myself. And all of a sudden, the whole stage fills with people praying with me and for me and, and all of that. It was amazing. They go back to their seat. This guy comes to me afterwards and he said, I was so just begging God to do something. He said, I walked to the back of the church and he said, I, I'm praying and I have my eyes closed. And he said, I put my arms up like I was gathering around the church and just said, Lord, get people to move. Help people. He said, and he said I don't know why I said this. I just said, Lord, fill the stage with people. And he said, I, I, I have my eyes closed. I look up and there's tons of people on the stage praying for you. And he said, it blew my mind. He said, I just said, Lord, he said, Lord, just answer my prayer. Just show me that you're real and answer my prayer. And then all of a sudden that happened. And what I'm saying to you is this, that I believe that as God begins to move, God likes to confirm things in our hearts. And just, to, I, I believe, just let, it, let us know he is with us. And this morning, I just want you to know that as we come hungry, it may not look like you think week to week, it may look different, but if you'll come expecting, I believe God can do the supernatural, amen? amen? Another foundation of revival, and this is kind of an argument, does this start revival or does this come out of revival, but I believe it's all part of that, but it's, it's repentance, repentance. What I love seeing about Asbury right now, what's going on, is people are openly repenting sins in their life. That God is moving in a way where people are openly saying, God, forgive me of this. And they're confessing sin. And they're they are being healed because of that. And listen to me. I believe part of what God does in revival is begin to work in our hearts so that we want to repent. That we're not running from him, but we're running to him. We're like Isaiah. And because many times we think whenever we need to repent that we're far from God. That repentance means we're far away. But the truth is this. The closer you get to God, the more you will realize you need repentance in your life on a regular basis. Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. He had never been closer as far as seeing him like that than he was in that moment. But he didn't say in that, one, that moment, look at there, praise the Lord, I got to see all of this. He says, woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. Whenever he saw the holiness and the goodness of God, he realized how much he needed the grace and the mercy of God. And listen to me, repentance is not a sign that things are going the wrong direction. Repentance is we're going in the right direction because the closer we get to the holiness and the light and the goodness of God the more we realize we need that in our life and repentance begins to work in us and through us amen, amen. Evan Roberts who had the Welsh revival he had four points 
that became very known. Uh, I'll read the other three first. Put away doubtful habits. Obey the Holy Spirit properly. Confess Christ openly. But number one was this. Confess any known sin to God and put away any wrong done to others. Confess any known sin to God and put away any wrong done to others. And I believe that whenever God begins to move in his power, it causes us not to run from him. Because if you're like most of us, myself included, growing up, I was scared to death of God. I was scared that God was going to knock me down and kill me in an instance. And listen to me, there's a difference between holy fear and being scared of God. I believe in holy fear, and I believe God is, is, is bringing that back to the church where we have fear and reverence of who God is. But we are not called to be scared. Whenever my child messes up, I don't want them to run from me. I want them to be able to run to me, to know that I love them even when they do that. And the thing about God is God does not want us to run from him. But the truth is we're called to run to him in true repentance. And as we do that, he heals us and makes us whole. Amen? Amen. And then number three is humility. Humility. One of the things I love about what God is doing right now, if you hear from these universities, is this language. The students are leading this. The students are doing this. It, it's not a man. It's not a woman. It's not a name. It's this, this is happening. It's humility. I read a story this week I wanted to share with you. This is amazing. There was a man. Don't know, I don't remember his name. But in 2015, he came to Asbury Theological Seminary from Malaysia. He was a professor at a Malaysian Bible college, and he comes to the seminary to be a guest professor. And he, he, he comes, and he feels like God's going to do something. He goes back to Malaysia. Later on the next year, he comes back. Again, guest professor. He's there, and he's teaching. And, and all of a sudden, God begins to move on his heart that you and your wife need to move here. And so he loves his job. He loves what he's doing. He doesn't want to leave. He loves where he was at in Malaysia. But God said, move over here. And so he literally moves, it moves, and then his wife comes several months later. It took him about nine months to get all this planned out. This, by this time, it's like November of 2019. His wife comes at the beginning of 2020. In 2020, God speaks to him and says, I want you to pray for revival to come to Asbury. So for the last two years, he has been praying. But then God said, I want you to take signs, and I want you to write repentance on there, and, re and revival, and the I want you to walk around this city, and walk and jog, and exercise, and carry these signs. Now, I can't walk and jog without carrying signs. Can you imagine trying to do that? He said some people encouraged him, and some people mocked him. But he said, God called me to pray for revival for this place. Fast forward to May of last year. He had been working with the homeless population in Lexington, Kentucky, which is close to Asbury. And last May, he gets a call from New York City saying, we need you to come here and work with the homeless population and help us win the homeless population to Christ in New York City. He said, God, you have called me to this place, to Asbury, to pray for revival. But now they're calling me, and I feel like I should go. What do I do? And God spoke to him and said, if you don't go, I'm not going to send revival. Because if I send revival while you're there, you will take credit for it. And he said, I, got on a, I, I moved my family last May to New York City. And he said, when I heard that revival started at Asbury, I jumped on a plane. And he said, not because he said the Lord was gracious to me. Because he knew, I knew he was right. He knew that if I was there and it started happening, I would have told all those people that had laughed at me, look, I told you so. But he said, God moved me away so that I could not take credit for what he was going to do. And he said, the moment it happened, I jumped on an airplane and I came down and he said, I just wanted, and there's a picture of him quietly standing in the back. He said, I just want to experience what God is doing for myself because I prayed and believed for this. And listen to me, I want you to understand something. What God is doing in these last days are not about an individual. It's not even about one church. It's not about a denomination. It is about the Spirit of God. And if we're not careful, we will begin to think, God, you've got to do it a certain way with a certain group of people. And God is saying, I am getting names out of the way. I, I say this to you, but listen to me. The last several years, there have been big ministries, celebrity preachers that have fallen. And I believe it's because God is clearing the table. 
He's saying, I'm tired of people trying to take credit. I'm tired for names, trying to get all the glory. And God is saying, I am leveling everything to let you know it is not about an individual. It is not about a celebrity. It is about Jesus and his name only being glorified and magnified. And I believe right now what God is doing in these last days, these revivals that are taking place, and what God is going to do is not something so one person can take credit for it. It is going to be something he does and he uses groups of people so that at the end of the day he gets all the glory out of all of this because he is the master builder. It's not about Paul or Apollos. It's about Jesus Christ. He is the one building and as long as our foundation is Jesus. Listen to me. If your foundation is anything selfish, if your foundation is anything that you want to see happen or if your foundation is anything sinful, it is going to fall away but my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus name on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand amen he is the foundation and we have to realize what God wants to do, the spirit of revival that he is going to continue here and all that he's going to do listen to me it's going to happen because all of a sudden we begin to realize the foundation that we're laying is not about us. It's the foundation of humility. It's the foundation of repentance. It's the foundation of expectancy. It's the foundation of us coming and saying, Lord, I'm tired of coming with my agenda. But instead, I get out of the way so you can move. Would the worship team join me? I'm almost done. I believe this. I believe the supernatural things God is doing is going to continue because God is awakening his people for this moment. Listen, some of you today, I'm not even talking to unsaved folks. I mean, I'm talking to saved folks right now, not to unsaved folks. Some of you, you've tasted and seen, but you've held back. You've tasted and seen the Lord is good, but you're scared of what it looks like next. What happens if I really surrender? What happens if I really give him control? What happens if I really let God do what God wants to do in my life? What if he asks me to do some crazy things? You know what? I can't promise you he won't. But I can promise you this. Following him will give you a peace and a joy in your heart like nothing this world could ever offer. Following him and knowing that you're right where you're meant to be. And listen to me, I understand we all have different personalities. We express things differently. I get all that. But I'm not talking about an outward expression only. I'm talking about an inward heart. A heart of surrender to him. God's ready to move in your life right now. But here's what God wants to do. He wants to do it in you so that you can take it to where you're at and see lives change. Some of you have family members who need to be changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. One of the things that has bothered me this last week, I need to get off Twitter. Because that thing, people argue and fight on that thing even worse than Facebook. And here's the argument. Well, they're not doing everything like they're supposed to at these revivals. You know what? If that, that revival, they don't preach enough. They don't, let, me, let me just say this to you, okay? As nice as I can to whoever says those kind of things. Okay? Get your dead, dried up religion and move out of the way. Move out of the way. Because you know who criticizes revival the most? Those who aren't experiencing it. The ones that criticize the most are the ones who aren't experiencing it. I believe in, in, in judging everything honestly according to the Bible, making sure, but I am telling you this, if we're not careful, we will begin to look at things and we will begin to judge things critically and we have a critical spirit and all of a sudden it puts us in a place where we're not open to what God wants to do. But I'm talking to some hungry people today. I'm talking to some hungry people. Listen, there, there are things, there are dishes in my life I used to not like. And you know what? I opened myself up. I was a kid. I hated Brussels sprouts. Those things were nasty. They were of the devil. My dad didn't like them. We'd sit there eating supper and mama made them. And she'd say, son, eat your Brussels sprouts. And I'd say, what about daddy? And he would look at me like, boy, you be quiet. And she'd say, daddy, eat your Brussels sprouts. And you know what? As I got older, I used to like those things. Because at some point in my life, I opened myself up to say, you know what? This isn't what I thought it was. And I 
depends on how you cook. But if you ain't a good cook, I won't like your Brussels sprouts. But, but here's the thing. Many times we miss what God wants to do because we begin to prejudge everything and criticize everything. And here's the thing. I don't want to make anything happen here at Landmark Church. I don't want to manufacture it. I refuse for this to become a place where we're forcing things to happen just because we want to think something's got to happen. But I am telling you this. We want to be open to whatever the Spirit wants to do. Holy Spirit, have your will, have your way in our hearts and our life. Will you stand up? Hey everybody, thank you so much. We are so honored that you chose to join us today for this message. And our prayer is for you and your family that you would be uplifted and encouraged. If today you receive Christ or if you would like to give to the vision of Landmark Church, if you would go to our website, www.landmarkchurchok.com, there's more information there, how you can do all of that. And also if you have a prayer request, please let us know how we can be praying for you guys. We love you and hope you have a blessed time.